Hi, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, this is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and uh, we have got a webinar here for you today on engaging communities and MPAs, concepts and strategies from current practice. And this is a group from the University of Michigan, and I will introduce them in a minute. Uh, before I do, I just want to thank EBM Tools and Open Channels for partnering with us on this webinar series. This is a series on strengthening marine protected area networks, and if you're curious about what lies ahead, you can go to marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov and see the whole series, which is monthly. Um, we will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, so I encourage you, if you do have any questions, to go ahead and write them into the question box, and we will get to the, those when it's time for discussion. Um, I also just wanted to thank the University of Michigan School for Natural Resources and the Environment. They have been a great partner over several years in doing master's projects in collaboration with NOAA and in particular uh, with the MPA Center and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, this is just the latest in that series and we're really glad to have that opportunity and want to thank the students and the faculty advisors who have worked with us. So now I'm going to um, introduce the speakers who are going to be presenting today. We have uh, Samantha Miller, who is a uh, 2014 candidate in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment and focusing in environmental justice and behavior education and communication. Michelle Zelinkas, who is a 2014 MS candidate in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, focusing on environmental policy and planning and behavior education and communication. We have Matt Ferris smith who is a 2015 dual degree Masters of Science and Masters of Urban Planning candidate in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment and Urban Planning, focused on behavior, education, and communication. And finally, Joe Otts, who is a 2014 Masters of Science candidate in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, focused on environmental policy and planning. So I will turn it over to Samantha. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Samantha, today. you need to speak up a little. Oh, yep. Can you hear me a bit better now? Yes, thanks. All right, great. Well, thank you again, Lauren, for that introduction. And um, as you, as Lauren mentioned today, we'll be describing our project, engaging communities and MPAs, concepts and strategies from current practice. We truly are excited to be sharing the results of what we've learned from MPA managers and community members alike. Our team of six master's students has been collaborating with NOAA's National MPA Center for the past 14 months, and we're now wrapping up our final report. It will soon be made available online through the MPA Center website. And today we'll be presenting our synthesis about enhancing the capacity of MPAs to effectively engage with communities. From our interviews, we have had the privilege to listen to some quite inspiring stories and examples of community engagement, and we hope to convey that inspiration to you during that presentation. So first, a bit about our project scope. Our project scope is made up of two parts that were identified with help by the National MPA Center. One um, is to gather information about effective approaches to community engagement and MPA planning and management in the US. And two, to then share that gathered information with both MPA managers and community members. And uh, it's, uh, it's important to highlight that each MPA is unique and place-based, as is each community and the wide spectrum of MPAs and communities also lends to great creativity and effectively engaging communities. So before talking more about our design of the project, I'll quickly go over how we've defined some key terms. For the purposes of our project, we define MPAs as areas where natural and or cultural resources are given greater protection than the surrounding waters. Managers are defined as those employed by and working with an MPA both managers and staff. And community members are defined as those residing in close geographic proximity to an MPA. And I'll now briefly provide an overview of our methods. We began by doing a literature review on community engagement in MPAs, particularly in the US. We then compiled, compiled an interview protocol and began phone and face-to-face -face interviews of managers and community members. We also did an open response online survey. So in total, we conducted 61 interviews from 40 managers and 21 community members. Here's a map showing the locations of the interviewees and MPA, site, MPA sites represented. I'd like to note that our interview sample is representative of MPAs that have already been active in thinking about community engagement. NOAA's MPA Center helped to identify interviewees 
and even more interviewees were identified through a snowball process. So through our interviews, we have compiled a final report of our findings that will be made available online soon. It includes four main sections, which we will present on today. So you'll hear about the challenges to community engagement that were identified, what we believe from our interviews to be the key principles of community engagement. We'll spend a fair amount of time on delving into some rich examples of engagement with objectives and strategies. And finally, we'll conclude with some reflections, recommendations, and advice. So now I'll move on to our chapter on common challenges to community engagement. From our interview protocol, we asked managers and community members about challenges they faced for effective community engagement. After we finished our interviews, we organized responses into six overarching categories. The histogram at the right shows the percentage of response for the different categories and also compares responses of managers and community members. So the six categories are, from most to least frequently cited, communication, involvement, representation, resources, preconceptions, and staff expertise. And in the following slides, I'll give a brief overview as well as some key takeaway points that interviewees provided about the challenges faced. So on to the issue of communication. The main issues managers highlighted here in regards to communication is the overall difficulty of communicating the purpose and need of the MPA to community members. Managers listed challenges in generating awareness that the MPA exists. Also, communicating rules and regulations is challenging. One member called it, quote, a difficult sell. 21 interviewees, both community members and managers, listed difficulties in sharing complex information. Specifically, interviewees highlighted a need for clarifying and being transparent with crucial information. Managers spoke of language barriers, presenting difficulties in reaching populations with a language preference or requirement other than English. And this is also related to a challenge of equitable representation, which we'll touch on a bit later. The second most cited challenge is related to involvement. Overall, managers found lack of interest in MPA participation to be challenging. Managers said that people want to feel that participating is worth their time and effort. Additionally, managers and community members both said there simply isn't enough time or energy to do everything desired. The work or volunteer balance with the rest of life can be demanding, which can result in lower participation. The challenge of conflict-motivated engagement can be summed up nicely by a quote from a challenge, Channel Island staff member who said that public attendance at advisory council meetings is, quote, almost a direct function of whether there is rulemaking going on at the time. And then the challenge of representation. A key point mentioned about representation is the challenge of equity. There are challenges in ensuring representation of all voices. Interviewees also mentioned challenges when trying to incorporate diverse perspectives. Often there are multiple groups with competing interests. Also, communities can be diverse and dispersed. One manager in particular mentioned that seasonal residents, newcomers, and immigrants are often hard to represent. Resources broadly include time-based and funding-based challenges. The main takeaway we heard in interviews is that funding limitations are ubiquitous. They directly preclude certain outreach activities, but they can also serve as the underlying factor and other challenges that MPA managers and community members face. As the quote says, it all costs money. Time was mentioned in terms of MPA processes being slow. Another manager spoke of one year worth of weekly meetings in order to arrive at common goals and objectives for an MPA. Preconceptions relate to challenges of reaching people who have inaccurate beliefs about an aspect of the MPA. According to interviewees, government distrust can fuel the spread of misinformation, which in turn can further erode trust. Community members sometimes have inaccurate expectations that relate to the function or purpose of a component of the MPA. And additionally, managers reported that misinformation can spread throughout communities, whether intentionally or not. And some claim that social media has exacerbated this issue. Staff expertise was only cited as a challenge by eight managers and two community members. The main takeaway these managers emphasized is a need for additional skills of facilitation and communication. One staff member at Biscayne National Park, after leading a class for community members, said, quote, we were definitely too technical. We were not trained in outreach and, communi and communication. 
Managers mentioned that they strive to hire staff that have good communication skills, and as will be shown later in our presentation, many examples exist of creative and effective communication and facilitation efforts by MPA staff. So now that we've identified the common challenges to community engagement, we'll now make the transition to talking about key principles, which Michelle will explain for us. Thanks, Samantha. So in our interviews, we asked MPA managers and staff questions about their experiences with community engagement and what advice they would offer other managers. As we looked at all of our interview data, we noticed several common themes that came up repeatedly as answers to these questions. These ideas were really at the heart of effective community engagement. Things like being proactive and starting engagement early, making participation worthwhile, and building on common needs and goals. According to our interviewees' experiences, these key principles listed here are central to effective community engagement and collaboration. Next, I'll go into more detail on each of them. The first principle is to be proactive and start early when building relationships and engaging the community. The managers we interviewed told us about the importance of providing opportunities and a meaningful purpose for community engagement. Many interviewees told us that including stakeholders in conversations in the early stages of a process is an important step that builds trust, promotes problem solving, and often prevents misunderstanding in the future. A great example is that Thunder Bay's National Marine Sanctuary staff make a point to attend events and meetings held by other organizations, including ones held outside of normal business hours. Sanctuary staff sit on boards of the local Boys and Girls Club, the Chamber of Commerce, and the school board. And as one manager put it, quote, it's not enough to say, come to the sanctuary and I'll tell you how you can help me. We go to their meetings and say, how can we help you? Another important piece of early involvement is setting expectations. The public needs to know how their input may make a difference and what things they cannot influence. MPA managers and staff should have an understanding of what forms of community engagement are possible now and in the future and they should communicate that clearly to the public. Another key principle that managers and staff brought up in their interviews was the need to be clear about the purposes of the MPA, as well as the terms that are used in management and planning. Clear communication and transparency through every stage of MPA planning are important. Visitors are more likely to follow coached rules about what they can and cannot do in an MPA if the reasons behind them are also clear. So while the signs shown on the slide cautioning visitors against interacting with alligators may seem for the most part like common sense, in other cases, rules about keeping out of certain areas may seem arbitrary unless visitors know that they're meant to protect a fragile habitat and the species it supports. Community members may also be inspired to learn more or get more involved in stewardship activities if they know why the MPA is there and what it's protecting. It's just as important to clearly communicate what is meant by different terminology. For example, the term marine protected area has negative connotations with some user groups who assume that all MPAs are no tape reserves. In these cases, doing something as simple as clarifying the definition of an MPA could help MPA managers as they're trying to engage community members who are initially opposed. Another point is that confusion over language can really overwhelm stakeholders especially when they're dealing with complex technical and legal information. As one community member told us, quote, if everybody understands what you're talking about, all of a sudden it becomes a lot less fearful. Once MPA staff and community members understand and speak the same language, they'll be able to work more effectively together. A third principle in making participation is making participation worthwhile for community members. This involves understanding, validating, and responding to the community's concerns. Many of the MPA managers we interviewed emphasized that ultimately, people want to make a difference and feel, feel that their efforts are having a positive impact on something they care about. One interviewee put it nicely, quote, people have to feel like they're contributing. Some view consultation as you coming to them to get comments that aren't necessarily going to get incorporated. So understanding as much as possible about what community members value helps MPA practitioners communicate with them in ways they understand, which is key to uncovering shared interests and common goals. For example, 
a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee, emphasized the importance of trying to see through the community's eyes and incorporating that into communication about the mission of the NPA. As an example, he explained that some stakeholders may care less about protecting certain endangered species, like the piping plover shown here, but more about protecting their way of life for future generations. So explaining wildlife conservation as a protection of our national heritage helps community members understand why preservation of some species might actually be important to them after all. Another key theme centers around responsiveness. Public meetings are legally required to solicit and record community feedback, but checking this box, so to speak, without thoughtfully analyzing community members' interests and working with them to find solutions can actually be counterproductive. Many of the NPA managers we spoke with emphasized the importance of being responsive to community members' concerns through encouraging them to participate, truly listening to what they have to say, and returning to them for feedback. For example, a staff member at NOAA's MPA Center in Monterey, California, works with community members in participatory GIS workshops that map ocean uses in California and aim to help inform MPA planning decisions. She explained that connecting with stakeholders and maintaining relationships through subsequent workshops, rather than just calling it a day after de gathering data, has really been key. Another theme that came up quite a bit was the need to be inclusive of all the different groups within the local community. MPA managers pointed out that the people who attend public meetings at government offices don't generally represent the full community. To reach broader parts of the population, they recommend going outside of the MPA to join community members in places where they generally meet, such as clubs and social venues. In other words, casting a wider net to reach populations that they normally wouldn't. Multiple interviewees also commented that some important people to connect with are resource users who make their living from the waterfront, such as commercial fishers or tour boat operators. Resource users will be naturally engaged and particularly invested in the resource which may translate to a more proactive community. These community members may also help spark conversation and action within the community. But it's also important to balance outreach with others who may not have an economic stake to make sure that all community interests are being represented. Another principle that managers highlighted was building on common needs and goals. Many of the MPA practitioners we interviewed emphasized the value of helping parties discover shared interests to build solutions around. Though so some MPAs find common ground by emphasizing a shared history to boost pride in a place. For example, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary did a great job of rekindling local interest in the history of the Great Lakes. The sanctuary brought new attention to Thunder Bay shipping history, and according to the mayor of Alpena, it served as a lifesaver for the community when the recession hit later that decade. Similarly, a mutual need for resources can foster collaboration and fuel partnerships with groups that may appear to share little in common. As one interviewee put it, quote, there are such limited resources here for everybody that you have to partner to get anything done. So the first principle I talked about was about being proactive in forming relationships and reaching out to communities. And coming full circle now, almost all of our interviewees mentioned that successful community engagement always begins with relationships, which are built on understanding and trust. Many managers explain the importance of going beyond the microphone and forming relationships in local communities in different ways, other than through just public scoping meetings. For example, the superintendent of Cape Hatteras National Seashore spends a lot of time meeting with leaders and stakeholders throughout the community. One thing he said was, quote, if it's a relationship where you only show up at the door when you have an issue and you need something, it's not really a relationship. And this was a sentiment that was echoed by many of the other managers we interviewed, that effective community engagement only begins with real relationships. So the guiding principles I've just discussed are key for effective collaboration and community engagement in many of the MPAs we looked at. While these principles provide an overarching perspective of how MPA managers involve community members in meaningful ways, Matt will go on to present specific objectives for community engagement illustrated by real world examples. Thanks, Michelle, and hello, everyone. So in addition to the principles that Michelle just described, we organized our interview findings into six objectives. 
And this is really the, the, what was at the heart of our project. These objectives describe why managers engage with their communities, and they, they represent the desires and expectations of the MPA managers who lead community engagement efforts. I'll describe the first of these three objectives, um, and along with some strategies that MPA managers use to meet them. My colleague Joe Otts will describe the final three objectives. Before we start, uh, there are two points I should mention. One, we did not evaluate the success of community engagement efforts. Instead, these objectives and strategies provide a snapshot of what MPA managers are currently doing to involve communities in their local MPA. The second point is one that Sam touched on earlier in the presentation, and it's the point that these quotes emphasize, that these objectives and strategies aren't going to be appropriate for all places and situations. They are not best practices or a blueprint for community engagement efforts. Instead, the people we spoke with emphasized the need to really tailor community engagement efforts to local communities. In our interviews, we heard that community members don't always realize an MPA exists, stopping engagement before it starts. And as you can guess, this problem is attributed to the hidden and inaccessible nature of MPAs, whose key features are offshore and underwater. To help address this challenge, many community engagement efforts try to increase awareness and raise the visibility of MPAs. And one way to raise the visibility of an MPA is to use novel signage. As an example of this, an MPA in Oregon takes advantage of a busy highway that runs along its shoreline boundary. Supporters of Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve were eager to raise awareness of their MPA. So last year, they adopted one mile of Highway 101. The MPA posted photos of their adoption on Facebook, which drew additional attention. As another example of signage, uh, you don't see it on the slide here, but Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Michigan has placed billboards about the sanctuary along roadsides in northern Michigan. That's a simple approach to increasing the visibility of that MPA. And many of the managers we spoke with mentioned using Facebook to help raise awareness of their MPA. And one thing that's nice about social media is that it's very scalable. For managers that don't want to devote much staff time to Facebook, they can repost other things from around, around the web, which is what Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary has done in the left-hand graphic here on this slide. If more staff time is available, you can post original content, like the graphic on the right, which highlights photos from an outreach program run by the sanctuary. We also talk to managers who piggyback on other efforts to keep their Facebook page fresh. For example, Monterey Bay sometimes posts photos taken by their research teams. Managers we spoke with also increase awareness of MPAs by providing services to specific users in a community. For example, some national marine sanctuaries provide fishermen with current information about weather and sea conditions at a number of marinas. This data is available online and at physical di displays set up at strategic locations. And the data is branded with the National Marine Sanctuary's logo and includes information about sanctuary resources and programs. Similarly, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary helps fishermen by providing information about the location of shipwrecks, which are often good places to find fish. Fishermen who use this information are reminded about the presence of the sanctuary. These examples represent just a few ways MPAs are increasing their community visibility. The activities noted here offer two lessons, I think. First, it may make sense to take advantage of activities that are already happening, whether that's people driving along a highway or a dive team doing research or community members browsing Facebook. Second, once these strategies are in place, they may not take a lot of staff time or money. By tapping into existing activities and needs, these MPAs enjoy increased visibility while using resources in a manner that can be sustained over time. Community members who are aware of an MPA's presence may still wonder, so what? And the second objective answers this question by helping people understand an MPA's purpose and resources. And the three strategies noted here can help communities to appreciate and become involved with their local MPA. So to help people move beyond simply being aware that an MPA exists, staff at many MPAs physically go out into communities. For example, staff at Biscayne National Park regularly travel to deliver guest lectures to schools, to scouting groups, boating clubs, and marine supply stores. Groups usually request the lectures or presentations for a specific event or topic, 
such as a career day or on an issue staff are dealing with at the park. An intern at Biscayne recently developed a presentation about lionfish, which you can see in the photo at right here. It's an invasive species, uh, and the intern is going to use the slides while leading lionfish dissections in classrooms across the county. The picture on the left shows Biscayne staff who had a table set up at the Miami International Boat Show this past February where they answered questions about the park. Some BMPAs offer incentives to help people gain a deeper understanding of what an MPA does. For example, Rookery Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve offers workshops that can help professionals in their careers. One of the classes helps landscapers reduce the cost of their projects while also showing them how to limit fertilizer runoff, which is an important issue for the estuary. Another Rookery Bay workshop provides participants with a master naturalist certification, which can help eco-tour guides, naturalists, and educators in their careers. Rookery Bay's workshops have spread nationally, with nearly all national estuary and research reserve sites now offering workshops geared for local professionals and policymakers. Some of the people we spoke with mentioned a balancing act that MPAs face. Yes, they want people to understand and appreciate MPA resources, but they also want to protect these sites. As a compromise, some managers report being strategic in how they market themselves. Shipwrecks are a good example of this. Instead of prohibiting visitation to vulnerable shipwrecks, which could lead to more looting, Biscayne National Park advertises a selection of shipwrecks through its Maritime Heritage Trail feature which the park promotes through flyers, brochures, and at the park store. So as with the awareness building activities I noted earlier in the presentation, the examples noted here are far from exhaustive, yet they too offer a lesson. They suggest, I think, that face-to-face -face interaction may be key to helping communities understand what an MPA does and what resources it provides. Many of the activities I've mentioned up to this point are one-shot experiences. A community member sees a billboard, or they attend a workshop, or they visit a shipwreck. In contrast, the third objective highlights activities that occur on a regular basis. These activities take many forms, from formal gatherings to informal working groups. And the people we spoke with said that by bringing people together repeatedly over a period of time, these activities help to develop respect and trust among those involved. Sanctuary advisory councils, which you've probably heard of, are an example of a formal collaborative method. These councils advise each of the 14 national marine sanctuaries on issues related to designation and operation. And sanctuary advisory councils can be a good way for MPAs to work with particular groups in their community. For example, the Sanctuary Advisory Council at Monitor National Marine Sanctuary has two council members who are divers. Uh, and these divers, uh, they have credibility within the broader diving community so they can help information to flow smoothly with the MPA. This is effective because, as a staff member at the sanctuary put it, the information is, quote, coming from one of their own and not from us. A more informal example of a collaborative method is to simply meet for coffee or a meal. At the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the Sanctuary Advisory Council meets for coffee and lunch every other month. You can see their schedule here on the left. The dates and times are posted online in advance and are open to the public. These coffee and lunch events provide a less intimidating opportunity for people to become engaged. And a third example of a collaborative method involves an online mapping tool called SeaSketch. This tool has helped stakeholders in different physical locations in the Channel Islands to discuss possible MPA marine reserve boundaries during multiple sessions if desired. Each participant has the ability to draw a different reserve design, which can then be jointly analyzed and discussed. The strategies I just mentioned, advisory councils, casual gatherings, and the C-Sketch tool, provide a, a brief picture of how sustained collaboration between MPA managers and communities can work. At this point, my colleague Joe Ops will discuss the final three objectives for community engagement efforts. Great, thank you, Matt. So I'm Joe Otts, the fourth and final presenter here today. I'm going to walk you through objectives four through six, which, as you see on your screen, are encourage stewardship behaviors within communities that benefit the MPA, enable others to help advance MPA objectives, and instill community ownership and pride in the MPA. 
Promoting good stewardship behaviors has pretty straightforward implications. For one, it encourages community members to take responsibility for the health of their NPA. It also encourages them in behavior that is conducive to meeting that responsibility. Ideally, too, by simple virtue of the community members' own leadership, it encourages others around them to take up that responsibility as well. One example is NOAA's Blue Star Program. Through this program, dive boat operators in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary can choose to become Blue Star certified. This indicates that the operators are, one, knowledgeable about the marine environment, and two, promise to share that knowledge with their clients. So essentially, it helps sanctuary managers reach people who don't directly interact with the sanctuary staff. NOAA provides training to boat operators who must then meet some additional requirements, one of which is to employ teaching protocols aboard their boats aimed at instructing their clients in good stewardship behavior during their dives. Once the boat operators are certified, NOAA provides them with special decals for their boats and also gives them free placement on the sanctuary website. This website promotes both the dive operation and the Blue Star program. At least one Blue Star certified boat operator we spoke to said that tourists aboard his boats are often very eager to learn about the marine environment. He also mentioned one study he was included under it apparently showed that tourists diving from his boats recorded significantly fewer touches with the reef than those who dove from other non-Blue Star certified boats in the area. Another example is the Makai Watch Program in Hawaii. This program follows the neighborhood watch model of community caretaking. It gives local residents an opportunity to help actively manage their marine resources. Name Named after the Hawaiian word for ocean, the program is a partnership between the state of Hawaii, local communities, and nonprofit organizations such as the Nature Conservancy. Activities include outreach and education, research, monitoring, and even enforcement. The Makai Watch program is also flexible. It allows communities to focus on their particular interests and perceived needs. For instance, a community that experiences high levels of tourism can focus their Makai Watch program on stewardship behavior and education. Alternatively, a community that relies on fisheries may specialize in research and monitoring. And while community members cannot be directly involved in enforcement, they can report violations and gather information to assist authorized law enforcement personnel. The Makai Watch program has actually been so popular in Hawaii that MPA managers there caution others. They stress the importance of being able, being prepared to feel that interest from the community. And they suggest taking proactive measures to ensure capacity to cater to that desire. NOAA's Marine Debris Program is another great example of encouraging stewardship behavior. Since its 2006 authorization of the, under the Marine Debris Act, the program's mission has been to investigate and solve the problems that stem from marine debris. As the problem is so large in scale, the program operates mainly through partnerships. These include state and local agencies, tribes, NGOs, academia, and industry. Meanwhile, it aims to change the behavior in the public through outreach and education initiatives. For instance, the program and its partners offer free, downloadable education and outreach materials for people of all ages. This includes formal education curricula for grades 1 through 12, which teachers can use to guide their students. The program also works with its partners to conduct monitoring and removal activities along the seashore, like the one pictured here. One MPA manager we spoke with in the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve in Port Orford, Oregon, Describe the stewardship that they promoted through the program as encouraging a, a sense of ownership. We found this particularly fitting because indeed ownership would help alleviate this problem to begin with. Strategies employed by managers to enable others to help advance MPA objectives really fell into two different categories. The first category is building relationships with outside parties, often embodied by partnerships or quote unquote friends groups. The second is training outside parties, often embodied by citizen science initiatives. The potential of partnerships is very apparent after listening to interviewees. A great example is Friends of Rookery Bay. This is a nonprofit organization that partners with the Rookery Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve outside of Naples, Florida. According to the Friends of Rookery Bay website, they're a volunteer citizen support organization. Their mission is to increase informed community support for management of the reserve through a program of stewardship, research, and education for community members. 
They also work to raise funds by engaging individual donors, businesses, and philanthropic foundations throughout the community. The crowning achievement of this partnership is the Rookery Bay Environmental Learning Center. It is a facility co costing upwards of a million dollars that now serves to foster an in-depth interactive learning experience for visitors to the estuary. The money, however, for this facility did not come overnight. Even though the area is pretty affluent, when the partnership was first established in 1987, it only yielded several thousand dollars per year. And this is obviously not the kind of money necessary for the learning center. So the real success of this example stemmed from the effort on the part of MPA managers to really ask Friends of Rookery Bay, as well as the community at large, what they wanted to see happen in the MPA. MPA managers also worked to keep these parties abreast of the needs of the MPA and engage them towards envisioning the options for improvement. A great example of a citizen science initiative is the Citizen Archaeologist Program at Monitor National Marine Sanctuary in North Carolina. This program is put on via a partnership between the sanctuary and archaeologists from the Mariner's Museum. The goal of the program is to teach experienced divers how to become underwater archaeologists. Basically, these participants learn how to map a shipwreck, take, take underwater photographs, and video and create mo photo mosaics. They then share their findings with the sanctuary, thereby alleviating the need for the sanctuary to pay professional underwater archaeologists to perform much of the same work. And because the qualified staff archaeologists provide the training for the participants, there's an acceptable level of confidence that the information the citizens provide with, return with, is accurate and useful. Meanwhile, the participants really enjoy it as well. The class, for one, gives them the opportunity to learn a new skill, but they also become impassioned about contributing to the body of scientific knowledge on shipwrecks. All the while, the relationship between the dive community and the MPA managers is strengthened, and this can be of great value in its own right to all involved. Instilling community ownership and pride in the MPA. This essentially involves making the MPA a part of the community's culture and identity. It also involves breaking down the geographical barrier that separates the two. Sometimes this means taking what is inherently quote unquote marine and bringing it into the homes and lives of the community members. Alternatively, MPA managers can take the daily activities or cultural livelihood of the community members and actually center or found it in the MPA. A couple of examples here should help illustrate. The first example is the catch and cook program. This program is put on as partnerships between charter boat fishing captains and local restaurant tours in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. Those who charter a boat and catch fish that day can have it cleaned and cooked as part of a full course meal at the restaurant partner. Additionally, a list of Michigan beers and wines are offered to further the uniquely local component to the experience. As a result, the day out on the water is brought back onto land and turns into a night to enjoy. It also provides an opportunity for that marine identification to linger with the participants. This then facilitates and furthers the MPA's integration with the culture and lifestyle of both the fixed and visiting community members. Another example is the Fresh 45 initiative by a group of high school students, again in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. After sanctuary staff made a presentation on branding to the local high school's marketing class, the students self-initiated an effort to tap the momentum of the town's marketing campaign. The group named itself Fresh 45 because of the Freshwater Great Lakes Sanctuary and its location at the 45th parallel. Its mission is grounded in attracting Alpena teens back to the community after college. To do so, they seek, as one student put it, to highlight things that we already have here. Partnerships and events have included dances at a workout facility named Bay Urban. They're also beginning to collaborate with a glass bottom tour boat company called Alpena Shipwreck Tours. And finally, they're planning a 2014 after prom party. So the Fresh 45 program is really attempting to anchor the inspirations of the youth in the local and marine environment unique to Alpena. This should then help make the MPA a part of their identity. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. After interviewing 40 MPA managers and staff members and 21 community members, we feel we have consolidated a sizable list of community engagement challenges, principles, and strategies. Due to time constraints, we were unable to describe the challenges and principles in great detail here today. We were also unable to list all of the strategies that MPA managers are currently using. For the full version, we refer you to our forthcoming report. 
In the meantime, though, we would like to reflect on our initial goal of this project, which consisted of two parts. The first part was to gather information about effective approaches to community engagement in MPA planning and management in the U.S. The second part was to share that information with both MPA managers and community members. In pursuing this goal, it became apparent to us that engaging MPAs with communities can be a very difficult task. However, it also became apparent to us that there are creative, thoughtful people working to do so in myriad ways across the U.S. They are intent on proving the management of their MPAs, and they have found very unique, effective ways to engage communities in so doing. Therefore, for the sake of those who have worked so hard to make strides in this area, we hope we have encapsulated your lessons effectively. Meanwhile, for those who wish to improve in this area, or for those who may just now be picking up the baton, we truly hope the results of our project will enlighten and empower your efforts in this regard. Indeed, every day is another opportunity to better engage our remarkable MPAs with their communities, and sharing lessons between MPA managers will undoubtedly assist that effort. We would like to thank all of the MPA managers who have very graciously taken time out of their busy schedules to interview with us. This project is based heavily on feedback from staff working in the field. Therefore, without your participation, this would not have been possible. Also, we would like to acknowledge our clients, Lauren Wenzel, Acting Director of the National MPA Center, and Ellen Brody, NOAA's Great Lakes Regional Coordinator. We also acknowledge our project advisor, Dr. Wu Julia Wandelek, Associate Professor at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. For questions or comments, we invite viewers to email us. We'll be more than happy to respond. And a copy of our full written report will soon be available at the internet address listed on your screen. At this point, we open the floor for any questions from the audience. OK, thank you very much to Samantha, Michelle, Matt, and Joe. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, uh, the folks on the phone who are listening, to go ahead and write your questions and comments into the question box.